for climate action for women by women reminds me of a beautiful work by poet nirala wo todti patthar dekha maine use ilahabad ke path par wo todti patthar she a stone breaker on the road to ilahabad i met her a stone breaker not the slightest shadow the cool of which she might have greeted her dark body with holding youth eyes lowered thoughts buried in the stones she breaks wielding the unwielding hammer she strikes before her sprawl the huge mansions the mounting sun on a hot day the blaze of heat the scorching wind the earth like cotton seared with a mist of dust overspread yet another afternoon saw her a stone breaker looking up she saw me saw the saw the houses but saw them with blank unseeing eyes saw me through undefeated eyes i knew them what i had never known before she a stone breaker a moment later her body trembling there fell a drop from her sweat washed forehead turning once more to the stones she said i a stone breaker with the latest data we now understand that there is a vital link between gender social equity and climate change and we recognize them without gender equality today a sustainable future an equal future remains out of reach women are more likely to get affected by climate change as nirala makes us realize our culture and philosophy has always looked at women as a principal source of energy in vag suktam the ecstatic self realization of vag ambridi is one of the most powerful assertions by a woman she identifies herself as a powerful energy source even where her breath blows forth as mighty winds the last verse of the suktam of rig veda is a declaration of a vastness and largeness she is her own power today igncia vadodara salutes the tremendous force the adi parashakti that woman is and pledges to look out for her through this webinar where we'll be joined by an illustrious list of speakers each magnificent in her own right i would now request my project associate shridhar pal to conduct this session and play the special message our honorable member secretary dr sachidanand joshi has recorded for us over to you shridhar hello everyone i'll just share the screen नमस्कार ऑन द ऑकेजन ऑफ इंटरनेशनल वीमेन्स डे आई एक्सप्रेस माय वार्म ग्रीटिंग्स टू ऑल ईच एंड एवरी वन इन द सोसाइटी बिकॉज वी नो दैट वीमेन स्ट्रेंथ वीमेन पावर नारी शक्ति डिनोट्स the completion of a personality no shiv is complete without the existence of shakti that is why shiv and shakti combined makes one complete personality and that is the importance of womanhood that is the importance of motherhood and it is really a matter of pleasure that we live in a country the bharat where worshiping the women power has always been the tradition if there was shaiv and vaishnavas there was also shakt tradition which was worshiping the shakti which was worshiping the goddess and even in the indian traditions it is written yatya narastu purjante ramante tatra devata and it is also written where the women power 
the mother, the lady of the society is not worshipped or it is not regarded, you will not have any kind of pleasure, any kind of happiness, even any kind of development. So, that is the tradition which we follow in our country that is the Bharat. And that is why celebrating the International Women's Day in India has a different meaning. Our concept related to femininity, our concept related to feminism, our concept related to the existence of women power in the society is entirely different. It has been throughout a journey of intellectual progress and creative wisdom through the eyes of womenhood in India. And that is why when we celebrate the International Women's Day, it has a different meaning. I am happy that our regional centre at Vadodara is organising a symposium on equality and inclusivity through the eyes of women leadership. And it is an important topic because this year's theme is break the bias and sharing is caring. And it is true that we need to come out of the bias, we need to come out of the inhibitions related to women leadership. Women have the equal opportunity in this society and they have to exercise equal power in this society. If you are led by a woman, the entire perspective of the organization, entire perspective of the society changes a lot because it also has not only the administration, the discipline, but also the current of sharing, a current of emotional feeling, a current of motherhood which is more important. In our society, we often see that wherever you have a women leadership, it has a different connotation. There are instances where women face some problem. There are instances where people have some kind of a bias against women. There are instances where people also think that women cannot deliver. But time and again it has been proved by magnificent examples given by women leaders that they can do it See. and they can do it better than the man. It has always been a matter of challenge for a man on both the fronts. That means on emotional fronts and professional fronts. It is the women power who can deliver with equal ease and authority on both the fronts. And that is why when they say that men and women are equal, I very frantically discard that statement. For me, man and women cannot be equal because women is far more superior than the man because she has the capability to create another life out of her womb. Man cannot do this. The God has blessed women with this special and additional strength of creation. She is the creator and when she is the creator, she is closer to the God as compared to the men. And that is why we must teach our children, we must spread this message in the society that women should be treated with a different eye and perspective. There is no sense of superiority of inferiority although but when you talk about equality, I think you have to understand the strength and power which the women have. That is an additional power, that is the blessing of the God. And with that idea, with that vision in the mind, we must celebrate the International Women's Day. 
we must also encourage the creative ability among the women who want to come forward and lead the nation, who want to come forward and lead the society. This symposium organized by our regional center and very nicely curated by our regional director, Ms. Arupa Lehri, also gives you an idea how seriously we think about the strength which is being vested in the women leadership. It is the sense of equality, it is the sense of authority, but also it is the sense of emotionality which counts. I know in today's panel, many eminent experts are there. They belong to different walks of life. They have different exposures and through their different exposure, they are going to tell us how they have successfully rendered, how they have successfully executed the works of their institutions and also impressed the society. This impression has to be enlarged many folds in years to come. India is a country which has always led the entire world intellectually, creatively. This is the subject on which India has to take the lead. We have remarkable examples from our ancient history. We have remarkable examples where we have seen women showing great strength and courage, great intellect and extraordinary creativity. All that has to be documented, recorded and told to the next generation. Once it is told, I am sure that we are going to be the change agents for the perspective of the entire world. It is really pathetic to see how women are treated in some parts of this world. Even the countries who boast themselves as the developed countries, even in those countries we see the pathetic situation of women. As compared to those countries, although we have been very wrongly painted through media, as far as the women treatment is concerned, we still feel that the things are better. We can make them best if we all are committed. Today is the day when we should take the pledge that we would try to change the saying and we become the change agent. If someone has to break the bias, we need to help them in breaking the bias. We must also tell the entire world that if sharing is caring is the talk of the day, we are the one who are most likely and most worthily be eligible for that because we have cared for the entire world. Vasudhev Kutumbakam is our global motto. That is how we say the entire world is one family. We belong to one family. And in my family, who heads, who calls the shot? It is my mother who heads the family, who calls the shots. So my salutations to the womenhood, my salutations to all the mothers, because I see mother in each and every woman of this society. And my salutations to the organizers, to the panelists, and my best wishes for this webinar. Namaskar. I wish everybody a very happy International Women's Day. Thank you, Dr. Sajidananda Joshi, sir, our honorable member secretary for such an inspiring work. Thank you, Arupa Lahiri, ma'am, for the wonderful welcome address. Today, we are honored to have such reputed speakers among us. I am Sriradha Paul, and I will be moderating today's session. In the interest of time, we'll be taking two to three questions after each talk. 
please type your questions in the chat box. We have Dr. Jasbir Singh Ji in charge of academic course and online event of IGNC Delhi to help us with the technical support aspect. Today, our first speaker of this interdisciplinary session is Dr. Sweta Prajapati Ji. She did her MA and PhD in Sanskrit from MS University, Baroda. She is the director of Oriental Institute, the Maharaja Sayajira University of Baroda. She has written several books and is known for her in-depth research in Nyaya philosophy and manuscripts and also in Sanskrit poetics. Today, she'll be speaking on women as portrayed in ancient Indian scriptures. Now. Thank you. Namaskar. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Am I visible also? Yes, ma'am. It's yes. perfect. Oh, okay. yes, so, uh, respected uh, Dr. Sachidanan Joshi ji, uh, Member Secretary IGNCA New Delhi, uh, Ms. Arupa Lahiri, Regional Director of IGNCA Vadodara Branch, uh, Sri Radha Jasbir Singh, and uh, my co speakers, and all the dignified women who are participating today in this webinar, and of course, men too, if there are any. First of all, let me congratulate uh, Ms. Arupa for hosting this maiden program in her tenure as a regional director of this center of IGNCA. I also express my best wishes on this Women's Day to all of you. As we know, when we speak about uh, the position of women in India, we have go back to our ancient literature that is our Vedas, four Vedas, our Smruti text, the Brahman text, and Upanishads. And even later on, but I'll restrict myself to these four type of texts. The civilization of any nation is best understood by a thorough study of the position of its women. In the long history of Indian civilization, our society has faced innumerable odds and social condition has changed a good deal from time to time. Even then, ancient Indian literature like four Vedas, Upanishads, Brahmanas, and Smritis exhibit an uniform spirit of reverence for women and Vedic religion does not deny any right to women. But along with national regeneration, the liberties and positions of women appear to vary, but even then, there is a constant attitude of deep respect for women ingrained in Indian mind, which is the direct outcome of teachings of Vedic religion. Besides the rites for rituals like Pumsavana, Kumari Puja, and her involvement and role in big sacrifices, women are also given right of Upanayana, Upanayana means the initiation of study and learning of Vedas. For initiation ceremony, it is said in Gruhya Sutras that Ashtama Varshe Brahmanam Upanayate. That means at the eighth year, a Brahmana is Upanayat. Here, it is not said that it only the man will be Upanayat, but all means men and women, girls and boys, both are here allowed for the upanayan, that means for the study. They can start their learning at the eighth year of their life. So here girls are not denied. This statement is for both girls and boys. We have enough evidences to show that women are entitled to be initiated for Vedic studies. The Rugved furnishes us with a long list of female seers called Brahmavadini, composing or discoursing on sacred texts. They are known as Brahmavadinis. 
So some some names are like Lopa Mudra, Vishwavara, Shikta, Apala, Ambruni, and Ghosha, etc. Such names appear in the Vedic texts that they are the Brahmavadinis. So there are two types of female students, Brahmavadini and another is Sadhyo Vadva. Now, who is the Brahmavadini? Brahmavadini are lifelong students of theology and philosophy. So say they are like the today's scholars, the professors in the universities or the scholars who are working for the whole life in this uh, field of education. So the Brahmavadini, they were the students for lifelong and they were study the philosophy. And Sadhya Vadva are those who prosecute the studies till their marriage. So their study is like a certificate that is necessary for the marriage. So most of the many girls, you know, they study today uh, for the purpose of marriage. And there are some who want to build their career. So they study for the long time. So here we can see there are Brahmavadini and there are Sadhya Vadva. So moreover, in Rugved and Ashwalayana Bruhya Sutra, we get reference to the fact that girls get husband only if they are educated. So there is a reference that a Brahmacharyena Kanya Yuvanam Vindate Patim. So they get good husband only if they are educated. So education of a girl has a value in the time of Vedic, uh, Vedic society also. So the dialogue of, see there are some women who were known as a great scholar of philosophy during the Vedic times. So one is Gargi. So Gargi, uh, the dialogue of Gargi with Yagnavalkya on philosophy reveals the Gargi's personality as a scholar. See, the Rusi Valmiki had two wives. He teaches his wives Gargi and Maitreyi the most abstruse philosophical doctrine of soul. Once in the court of Janaka, Gargi superseded Yagnavalkya in discourse on philosophy. There is another name, Bharti. Bharti once mediates in controversy between her husband Mandana Mishra and Shankaracharya. Women were addressing big assembly of scholars also. And therefore, the students from all over the country, they visited such lady seers for acquiring knowledge. The learned woman had very honored position in the society and therefore parents perform some special ritual. See, this is very important. They perform a special ritual for having a learned daughter. That is called Pandita Duhita. Duhita means a daughter and Pandita means learned. So the special ritual is mentioned in our Vedic text and the parents were performing that ritual to get the uh, Pandita Duhita, the intellectual daughter. So see how the respectful position a woman has in the uh, society. And no better honor could be shown to the learning of women than by depicting the deity of learning as goddess Saraswati, the highest recognition and respect. According to Panini, Panini was a great grammarian of Sanskrit. So according to him, girls were admitted to Vedic schools called Charana and the female students were called Kathi and the hostels, see there were hostels for girls and they, these hostels were called Chatri Shala. Now we speak about the right to education and freedom for all. Today we speak about this uh, slogans, these things, but in Vedic times, education was given to women without any discrimination. The society which gives freedom of education to women, it does not naturally deny any other rights to women. For the rights of women in property, all of our ancient texts advocate the same rights as of sons. Daughter is adopted as putrika in case of no son and see inherit all property and rights of a son. So in Vedic, Times adopting a son is not a necessity. The king of Vidar adopted Lopa Mudra, Kunti Bhoj adopted Kunti. Even sages adopted girls like Shakuntala, Paramadara, and a fisherman adopted Satyavati. 
in mahabharata it is declared that even daughters will be entitled to become rulers if there will be a no sons mahabharat being the story of heroic persons the women mainly depicted are heroic daughters wives and mothers regarding the rights of inheritance in parents property there are various views expressed in vedic literature the earlier literature do not support the right in property after marriage but a brotherless woman has a right even after marriage there are small number of sruti writers who advocate the right of inheritance of daughters along with son as early as 500 bc however very strangely i would say such passages in smruti text are considered as interpolation and i think this is a very you know convenient uh, way of uh, cutting down the rights of women by considering these passages as interpolations they consider that these passages are not real texts so it's very strange but only sukracharya in 13th century assigned the share of daughter in parents property it is important to note that even smruti writers like manu have recognized that time might come when their rules would become obsolete and have therefore declared that if any rules framed by them are found to be not conducive to the welfare of society or against the spirit of the age they should be unhesitatingly abrogated or modified if this is done the capacity efficiency and happiness of women in india will increase and as a result the nation will progress and she will contribute for the happiness of mankind thus from the investigation in the vedic literature it is amply clear that in vedic age women's position was up to the mark it is because the vedic society has satisfied all moral as well as social criteria of the ideal position of women it was the position which the modern woman is seeking for and that is why in our scripture it is said that gruhini gruham uchyate gruhini gruham uchyate that means a home is not home without a woman without wife or without daughter and putrena duhita sama that means daughters are equal to son and the best statement that everybody will glorify today is yatra naryas tu pujyante ramante tatra devata women want a man to respect her identity she wants a place in home and the society at least as a human being every woman need to awaken within herself a courage a transformation devotion and nurturing she has to realize the shakti the power within herself if she does so the society with a man or woman all are with them to uplift thank you very much thank you uh, arupa for giving this opportunity thank you thank you so much and how wonderful it is to find out the relationship between the women and the vedic tradition where there is no question of denial of women status in that society so thank you ma'am for sharing this uh, and also uh, i was quite surprised with the fact about the upanayanam uh, because it's kind of rare now being performed for women so thank you so much for sharing this uh, so now we will move on to our uh, uh, next uh, speaker but before that uh, anybody who, who would like to uh, ask any anybody would like to ask any questions there is no questions then we can if you have any questions please uh, write down uh, okay i i don't know ma'am probably uh, now uh, if there is any questions and all ma'am we will uh, personally email you and okay. hopefully yeah okay ma'am i i have a i have one question uh, dr uh, shweta prajapati thank you so much for agreeing and uh, coming here and being with us it was a wonderful lecture i wanted to ask you since you you know your research has been 
uh, over such uh, over manuscript uh, studies. I would like to ask that when did particularly when did you notice a change of position from such illustrious women to the you know to the movement of the society into more towards a patriarchal society? Because we always talk about the glorious women. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, uh, when, it, it, yeah. Yes. During uh, you know during Vedic times, uh, uh, there was no four varnas are described. Yeah. So that was a time when there were no four caste uh, system was there. Uh, but when this caste system came and uh, uh, slowly and slowly when the joint family system came up and with that uh, this uh, uh, means the man's uh, position over women that happened and then naturally uh, with the invasion of, uh, invasion of many kings over the country and uh, many other such uh, political and social situations when they change then this thing has happened to women. Thank you, ma'am. It was uh, indeed a pleasure listening to you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Shreya. Now our next speaker is Paloma Serra. She's the Deputy Consul General of Spain in Jerusalem. She's also a prolific poet and a storyteller. Her Poems Without Land is her third collection of poems after Peril Fondo and Leaving Af Africa. Some of her poems have been published in various anthologies, Rhymes Encrypted, and the rest is Silence, to name a few. She also co-directs the literary collection La Valija Diplomatica. So over to you, Paloma. And her topic today is bending patriarchy in bureaucracy as experienced during the tenure in India. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Do you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Yes. So, well, thanks, thanks uh, to you, and uh, of course. Uh, all the rest of, uh, of the women who are also uh, with us uh, today in this um, important uh, day. I would like to, to talk about, about, about my, my, I mean, a little bit of my career here or my career to, to become a diplomat in Spain. And um, also, of course, I will talk about my experience uh, in India as a, as a woman which I have to say has not been very different from um, other uh, experiences I had in other countries in, uh, in which I, I've been uh, working for the last uh, 18 years. But first of all, I think uh, that um, to understand a little bit more the problems you may encounter in, or the problems we encounter in our way, uh, the first uh, will be to start from uh, from the beginning when you choose to to be uh, something that is traditionally um, a male uh, profession such as a diplomat and uh, because the first problems or the first uh, challenges uh, you encounter is especially there when you when you start thinking about that I remember when I was at the university that uh, I, I come from a, from a small town in the north of Spain. And um, I have to say that, I mean, no one uh, wanted to be a diplomat because they didn't know they could. And especially for, uh, for women, that was uh, something that was not uh, even a possibility. And I'm, I'm talking not um, about 50 years ago, it's 20 years ago. 25 years ago. Uh, once I decided this, and um, it was thanks to a woman, I had a, a, a professor at the university um, whose husband was a diplomat and came to the university once uh, to brief us about something related with the European Union. So I had the opportunity to talk to him and he encouraged me to, to prepare the civil service exam to, to become a um, a diplomat. And uh, then when I moved to Madrid and I started studying, uh, this is when you start, I mean, um, um, encountering these uh, the problems or these questions from people 
that would never be addressed to, to, to a man, uh, such as uh, what are you going to do if you're a diplomat? What are you going to do to cope with your personal life? Um, do you think if you're a, uh, a diplomat as a woman, you could get married and you could have kids and you could have a personal life outside work, something that has never been asked to, to, to a man? Because of course, they, they are supposed to have someone at home who will take care of, uh, of, the, of the kids while they are working. And I remember that uh, one of my, the first things when I passed the, the exam and I, and I started my studies at the diplomatic school in Madrid in 2005, um, there was a, a magazine uh, which kept, well, came, some journalists came and um, uh, they, they wanted to ask some questions to, to a group of diplomats. And one of the questions was exactly this one that was addressed to me. If I, if I was ready to, to choose in my life, if I wanted a professional life or if I wanted a personal life. And I remember because well, I have the magazine at home uh, that I said that I want I wanted both things. I wanted a personal life and I want a professional career. And uh, well, it's, it has not been easy, but um, it, it has been doable, uh, at least uh, for me. I, I, I am lucky enough to say that I could, with problems, but I could uh, have I could done both of, the, of those, the parts that were very important to me. Um, once uh, I passed this exam and I started working, my first posting was Ivory Coast. After that, I was in Cape Verde for two years, and then uh, I moved to India. And um, if I really have to recall my tenure there, my, my, my three years in India from uh, 2011 till 2014, um, and my role uh, in my working role, I have to say that um, I also need to divide my uh, or, or the challenges, the challenges I found uh, divided into the professional part of my work and my personal um, uh, life or, or, or the personal relations I, I got to, to, to have there. Uh, because in terms of uh, my professional work as a diplomat, I have to say that I felt myself much respected, maybe because I was also dealing, especially the first two years, dealing with um, consular matters. And uh, for that reason, the, the people that wanted to see me, they, they always wanted something from me. I mean, they wanted a visa, they wanted a paper, or they need a document, or they need something. and. Um, and uh, they were very respectful. And I've never, um, ever during my, my work at the consulate, thought that I was being treated different because, because I was a woman. Uh, same thing uh, with uh, bureaucracy in terms of my visits to the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and uh, the, the rich cultural life I enjoyed in India during those three years. And um, because when you were with people that, uh, well, especially with other diplomats, but the rest of civil servants at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs were always not only very kind, but very respectful. And uh, I had at the time one other young colleague that came um, six or seven months later than me. And uh, we had uh, many things to do together and we were, while we were working. I never felt that I was discriminated at any point. Uh, but what I have to say, it's what I, 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 I really, I mean, I saw when I experienced there for many times is that regarding my personal life or uh, the rest of the things I had to do while I was out of the consulate. Um, yes, of course, I see, I, I, I saw this discrimination. For instance, I remember that when I was there with my with my uh, husband, um, every time we went to buy something or we went to any place, uh, people were only talking to him. And um, 
I won't say that this is only in India because I have experienced that in other places. But uh, I remember that every time I had to deal with the landlord, um, even it was me, the one who was working and the one who was paying the rent, he wanted to talk to him. And uh, this is the kind of discrimination that also my mother always told me that she had, I mean, experience in Spain uh, during some time, maybe not anymore or not as it was uh, before. Um, this is also a reflection of the society and the changes in society. And uh, that will, of course, eventually change. So I'm talking now about uh, the period that was uh, 10 years ago. And I, I really hope and I think that, uh, that uh, this situation um, changes, especially in a country where I met so many, I mean, not only brave women, but hardworking women um, in, the, in the diplomatic field and some other cultural fields, uh, very, very competent women um, everywhere. And I remember those hardworking women who were experiences uh, were experiencing at the time those uh, problem and uh, problems related to to their gender. That I really, I mean, I hope that uh, this uh, is uh, or could be in some way uh, easy, or could be now uh, different, or, or 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 not the same uh, hard problems that were enough. Um, how can we do or what we are doing to, to change this? I think that um, not only in India, but in the rest of the world is more uh, women's or feminist uh, outlook of things is, is, is really there. I mean, we, we, we are all working together to, to create this um, a situation in which we as women could feel safe and respected and um, could have this, uh, or at least have this gender equality that we really need for, for doing our, our jobs. No? So I've, um, the, the changes I, I, I have found in the, in the last years is that not that women um, agree with this, because of course they they have always agreed uh, with the with the idea that uh, we need more equality and the gender roles, I mean, should be equal. But more men um, are on board, and um, I have I mean witness and I have asked to other colleagues that have um, also. Um, work in India after me, that this situation was in a was better was better for them. Um, maybe especially because there there are more women in my when I when I passed I mean when I started to become a diplomat, we were only ninety five women uh, with uh, nine hundred men um, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, now, with more women uh, became, becoming uh, diplomats, uh, things have changed. And um, India has been at this, I mean, a posting where many women uh, have gone. And um, I remember that one of my best friends was there only three years ago. And um, we talk a lot about uh, the situation of, of women and uh, the problems she, she may encounter as a, as a, as a, as a woman there. And uh, I remember that, uh, I mean, she saw uh, a change of mentality, which is very, very hard to change, which is very, very hard to, um, uh, or people, it's very, very difficult that they move on or they, that they evolve. Uh, once they have learned and they have been educated in a certain system. But um, I have seen uh, a change and uh, the people in my embassy have, uh, have also seen a change there. So I really hope it's possible. 
And I really hope that we can all work together to, to get this goal uh, for all women and for those who cannot speak uh, for us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paloma. Uh, it's so nice that you shared your experience and your journey um, as a diplomat and the challenges you faced as a diplomat. And of course, uh, we need to be that agent and start dialogues so that change can happen. And we need to start right now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to you. Our next speaker is Dr. Alka Pandeji. She's an art historian, curator, and author. Dr. Alka Pandeji is an art historian who taught in Indian arts and aesthetics at Punjab University for more than 10 years. Her major fields of interest are gender identity and sexuality and traditional arts. Dr. Pandey, under the aegis of Charles Wallace India Trust, conducted post-doctoral research in critical art theory at Goldsmiths University of London. She is also the artistic director of Photography Binel Habitat Photosphere, a photography award instituted by India Habitat Center from 2016 to 2019 in Delhi, as well as the project as well as the project director of the first ever museum Binel in India titled Bihar Museum Biennial in 2021. She has set up the Kanha Museum of Life and Art and Singinawa, Madhya Pradesh and has also extensively written and edited books on India, aesthetics, culture and photography. Her award and achievements list run long. Currently, Dr. Pandey serves as a consultant, art advisor, and curator of the Visual Art Gallery at the India Habitat Center in New Delhi. Today, she'll be speaking on understanding equality and inclusion through the concept of Ardha Narishwara. Namaskar. Thank you, Sri Radha, for that lovely introduction. And I want to compliment Arupa Lahiri for organizing such a diverse range of voices from India and abroad to come together on our special day. Today is Women's Day and today is our day. And we are all going to celebrate it with enthusiasm, with love, compassion, inclusion, and identity. When Arupa asked me to speak on Women's Day, I could not think of anything better than this beautiful Leela Murti of Shiva, the Ardha Nari Ishwara, the Lord who is half woman. Now, when we look at gender and when we look at identity, what do we look at? We look at inclusion, we look at equilibrium, we look at balance, we look at harmony, we look at compatibility, and we look at respect. And for me, the beautiful icon, one of the most popular icons of Shiva after the Nataraj is the Ardhanarishwar image. I want to begin with a quote of Adi Shankaracharya from the Hargagraha Shutakam, which says, Kasturi Kakanam Dhanalepanayi Shamshana Bhasmam Gavavilepanaya Satakundalayai Fani Kundalayi Namashivaya Cha Namashivaya. It is so beautiful when the description of the Ardhanarishwar happens, the one who in the form of Gauri has covered one half of her body till the navel and sandal paste and the other half in the form of Hara with ashes from the Shamshan. 
the one who has worn a manohar kundala, a beautiful earring in one year, and wrapped a sarpa kundala snake around another year, to that Shiva, female Shivani, and that Shiva, male Hara, I bow. Whether it is in the Western theory of creation, that of Adam and Eve, the Indian construct of Purush and Prakriti, man and woman, or the Chinese notion of yin and yang, the very core of civilization stems from the concept of the union of the male and the female, each complementing the other. Hinduism has explored this sublime oneness further, subscribing to the concept of God as the singhata or some misrana, coalescing of male and female principles. It visualized God, the supreme power, as being Ardhanara, half man, and Ardhanari, half woman. And this imaging was given the name Ardhanarishwara or Ishwara, or Lord who is half woman and from whom sprang all Srishti or creation. Now, this was the background against which I want to show you some beautiful images, which were part of my book, Ardhanarishwar, the androgene probing the gender within published by Rupa. And in this book, what I wanted to really show was beautiful visual iconography, visual images, which actually subscribe to all the thoughts that we are talking about, inclusion, form, body, sharira, uh, identity, the coming together of male and female, the purush, the prakriti, the inclusion, the perfect complementality which comes in this celestial being. Now, let me begin with the image of, this is actually the uh, most recent image. And this for me really symbolizes uh, the perfect kind of complementality of man and woman. This is uh, an image of um, uh, what I call um, Javed in New York. Uh, done by, made, it's a photo image made by a Bombay-based artist who, sorry, not Bombay-based, but born in Mumbai, Jayashri Abhichandani, who portrays a Mumbai drag queen, Javed, wearing platform heels with a mobile phone in one hand, walking down an avenue in Manhattan. So this is a beautiful image. And this is also what we, we also call kinners in today's um, inclusive language. Then I wanted to show you uh, the image of a calendar image, a popular image of Ardhanarishwar. This is in calendar art. And what you see is that on the left side is Parvati dressed in a sari. And the left hand side is a forearm standing image. And what you see is very clearly demarcated the uh, icons of Shiva the Sarpa, the uh, Damaru, uh, and um, the uh, image of Parvati, she holds a lotus on the upper arm and her left arm is more in a Varad Mutra. On the le left-hand side of, Sh uh, of Shiva, of the image is Nandi, the Vahan of Shiva, and on Parvati's side is the tiger, which is her Vahan. The next image, which I want to show you, is a beautiful image from um, Badami in uh, Karnataka. And this is what I'm trying to show you is the Harihara. Now, in today's day and language, when we are looking at same sex, we are looking at, uh, you know, at this, we are trying to get away from homophobia and we're looking at the conjoination of two men together. This is 
Shiva and Vishnu and their offspring. In fact, when Vishnu took the form of Mohini, their offspring was known as uh, Ayappa. So there is a great inclusion of two males in this image where Shiva and Vishnu are conjoined in one image. Now, this is a beautiful image of Ardhanarishwar from the 8th century of the common era. Uh, this is in sandstone from Jhalavar in Rajasthan. And here, I don't even have to explain things to you clearly because the genitals of both the male and female are very pronounced. The firm breast on the uh, right hand side of the image and the erect phallus known as the Urdhvalinga is apparent on the side of this two-armed image of Ardhanarishwar. Um, now here is a how much time is that? This is a standing image of um, uh, Harihara. This is again Vishnu and Hari together carved from a single stone in a buff colored stone from the 10th century of the common era. Uh, the next image, I find this really interesting. This is actually uh, from the uh, Pala sculpture from Kagzipara in Bangladesh. This is in black sandstone from the 10th century. What you see in front is the uh, lingam, the, the, the icon of Shiva. And from the back, you see an emergence actually, which is of um, the Devi in a Dhyana Mudra. And in her frontal hand, she's offering to the symbolic manifestations of the linga, which is set on a yoni patta. So who holds the linga or the phallus of Shiva is the yoni of Parvati or the Devi. So what you see uh, uh, in this image is a beautiful manifestation of the emergence of the Devi literally from the uh, linga. Now, uh, this is an unusual image of Ganesh who's shown in a Ardhanarishwar form. This is from Padavali in Morina in Madhya Pradesh. This is a stone sculpture. And here too, I, it, I don't really have to explain too much in detail because the body is shown in Tribhanga. There is a very, very prominent breast, a female breast on the left hand side of the image. And in his trunk, his, the, the hand which is holding is a beautiful modak. Uh, the next image, again, a very unique image uh, from the Chola period, from, uh, from the uh, thousand uh, 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 century of the common era. This is from Thanjavu district. And here you see a beautiful three-armed image. You see the Tribhang of Parvati. She's dressed in a beautiful sari which goes to her ankle. It is held by a mekhala. She has she's wearing a kundal in her ear. Her hand is shown upward as if she's holding a lotus. And on the um, uh, left hand side of the image is Shiva, who's holding a trishul on the upper arm and the lower arm. It looks as if it is resting, probably. It would be as if it's on the Nandi. Now, this is a very, very interesting image in bronze uh, of Ardhanarishwar. And I wanted to show this because this is actually a dancing Ardhanarishwar. And this is the image, which is the uh, uh, manifestation of the artist and again the perfect complementality of male and female the four-armed image where uh, the Parvati is wearing a beautiful sari uh, and on Shiva's side his hair is in a state of disarray doing the chakkar because he's doing the exuberant dancing pose it is said that dance itself was taught by Shiva to Parvati. That is what the Shaivites believe. And the Shaks believe that it was Parvati who brought in the grace to dance. It is the 
Tandava of Shiva, the more virile dance, and the Lasya or the grace of Parvati, which brings the perfect balance and harmony and beauty to dance. So therefore, you have to have a perfect balance of Shiva and Parvati in dance to bring in the absolute beauty. Now, <clears throat> here I show you a beautiful uh, image of Shiva Kesava. It's known as Shiva Keshava. Why? Because it is Vishnu and Keshav together. Vishnu holding the Sudarshan Chakra and Shiva who's light colored. Uh, Vishnu is always shown to be of a darker, almost bluish color. And there is Shiva who's normally shown to be white with a blue in his throat because he was supposed to have uh, absorbed the halahala or the poison which he captured in his throat. And here you see Shiva, lighter colored, lighter uh, textured, wearing a tiger skin, holding a trishula. Now, this is a beautiful uh, Ardhanarishwar in white sandstone from Kannauj, central India. And what you see here, again, is the presence of Parvati with a single breast on the left side, the erect phallus on the male right side, standing in an exaggerated tribhanga. The forearmed image has clear male-female delineations through the icons with which each arm holds. The mirror and the lotus are on the side of the Devi. They are complete with the long sari, the palmira earrings, the bracelets, the coiffure, and the bejeweled mekla or girdle on the left side. Shiva's side arm holds aloft the trident, the serpent as the armlet, the jata jute or the coiled hair with the crescent moon embedded within it, and the male earring denoting the Purush aspect. The attendants personified Nandi's head for Shiva and the lion head for Parvati. They adopt a very, very playful disposition. Now, we have been seeing till now only um, images in sculpture. Now I am showing you images in painting. This is a beautiful painting again from um, Mandi in Himachal Pradesh. This is a seated four-armed Ardhanarishwar. Um, this is a, a representation of the composite image. There is a very sharp divide right and left of the image along the central axis. The male Shiva is on the right side while the female Parvati is on the left. Shiva is seated on a leopard skin and also attired in tiger skin. The left half Parvati is articulated in feminine attire and jewelry. All the forearms hold the icons of Shiva, the two Vahanas, chariot, the tiger for Par Parvati and Nandi for Shiva are placed on their respective sides. Now, these are the last two images which I'm showing. One is the Harihara, opaque watercolor with gold and silver, 17th century of the common era. And the last image is again that of Harihara or Shankar Narayan, the union of Vishnu and Hara. This is from Trichinopalli, 1825, from a series of 100 drawings of the Hindu deities created in South India. What for me really is interesting in this image and why I feel it is so relevant to today's world is that as we see women becoming more and more economically uh, empowered, their status in society, their status in culture is undergoing a rapid change within our society in particular. Earlier women were venerated as goddesses, but they were not having that kind of an equality in domestic life. Whereas in Indian philosophy, it was always that no prayer ceremony could be complete without the woman being present. Ardhangini, that is how the wife is known. She is half of the anga of the male, as the male is part of her own uh, 
consciousness. So Ardhangini, that is how she is known. And I think on uh, this Women's Day, uh, March 2022, the image and the icon of the Ardhanarishwar is more significant than ever before. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, and it's so uh, amazing to see. It was a visual treat, ma'am. Uh, as we journeyed from sculpture and from one era to another era and to painting and to the urban space, drawing parallels, uh, uh, like uh, drawing parallels and connections from the drag queen, drag culture and the queer community. So it is very interesting. And also the sculptures showing the manifestation of Devi and how it is an emerging, uh, like how it emerges, Devi emerges from Linga. It's very interesting. And thank you so much for generously sharing with us. And if anybody has any question, please write it in the chat box. question, but I just have one observation that just came to my mind. Thank you, Dr. Alka Pandey, for that wonderful lecture. And uh, I just remembered that during uh, the coronation of Lord Rama, he was forced to order for uh, a gold, a Sita made in gold, because uh, as you mentioned, the Ardhangini is absolutely essential in, it was absolutely essential in any sort of uh, Hindu rituals, so that that was wonderful. Uh, one sculpture that you showed of the Tanjavur bronze had two hands on the side of Hara and one hand on the side of Shakti. Uh, have you? Is it uh, is it an abnormal uh, design that you have come across, or is it like you know? Have you come across something like that even before? Thank you, Arupa, for that question. You know, in my study, when I was doing my uh, doctoral work, I traveled the length and breadth of the country. And I found that, uh, you know, it depend, depends a lot on the artistic imagination. So there were two arms standing, two arms sitting, three arms standing, three arms sitting, four arms standing, four arms sitting. There were Dashabhuja, uh, Ardhanarishwar dancing. Uh, Dasha Buja, uh, Ardhanarish were seated. So it all depended on the imagination of the artist. There are a lot of images where Shiva is shown as forearmed. So you see two arms on his uh, side and Parvati is shown as one arm. So you see just one arm on her side. So this image, the three armed image, these are uh, shown in many parts of the country, they are not unusual, but they are not as usual as the two-armed or the four-armed images where the numbers are balanced evenly. Thank you so much. And uh, ma'am, on this note, I would like to ask one more question. When you are telling about this three-armed uh, figures, so like can we reflect it deep and uh, think about balance like when we think about the balance yeah. and also the so, equality or role, what do you think about that so you know uh, Sri Radha I think in this image there could be Shaivites because there was a big divide between Shaivites and Shakts there were the Vamacharis as well in the Shak tradition. There was also the Tantric tradition. So when we kind of study the image of Ardhanarishwar, this could be a Shaivite artist who believed that Shiva was the more powerful person and he created Sh Shakti from his own energy. So therefore he was four-armed and she was two-armed. So that, that could be one of the reasons. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing such a wonderful talk. Thank you. I think there is a question, Shrada, from Uttaraji. Would you please read it out for uh, Dr. Pandey? Yes. Ma'am, I, I don't know. Something is wrong with my chat, and I'm unable to see the question. So I'll read it out. 
she is asking, uh, she's first of all congratulating you for this very wonderful lecture with stunning visuals. And then the question is, why not the one who is half man as opposed the Lord who is half woman? Interesting question, thank you. But again, it is whatever, you see, everything is now open deeply to interpretation. So when we see Ardha, Nari, Ishwara, so we see the Lord who is half woman. It could be a way of saying it. You can also say the woman who is half the Lord. So it depends on what interpretation you want to take. And I think in today's world where we are becoming more fearless of our own interpretations and are not looking back to our canons all the time for approval, I think one can also say either ways. We are free to interpret as because we all within us also carry a great deal of baggage of learning, a great deal of the baggage of understanding. And we always look with the baggage that we carry and view the icon or the image. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we will move on to our next speaker. Uh, is there any more questions? Uh, you can uh, write it in the chat box or else we'll move on. Okay. Yeah, uh, so thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, we will move on uh, with our program. And our next speaker is Dr. Kinga Povedak. She is a PhD research fellow from University of Seget. She studied European ethnology and American studies at the University of Seget, Hungary. Her recent publications explore vernacular religiosity during socialist Hungary Christianity and popular culture, Pentecostal charismatic Christianity. Today, she will be speaking on traditional female roles in Hungarian folklore. Um, unfortunately, I cannot start my camera for some reason, but do you see my slides? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I, I'm so sorry, but I, I probably won't take up time and, um, and I will just start. Do you see the slides in a full, full screen? Uh, no. Oh, uh, you have to put like, yeah, it's not full screen. I can see the. Okay, so they are not full screen. The icons. Oh, you, you only see the icons. Okay, I'm sorry about this. Okay. Do you see it now? Yeah, it's not coming, Professor, but uh, it's okay. okay. Uh, we can, actually, it's visible. I don't know what the problem is. I'm so sorry. But it is visible, so it's fine. So it's not, it's not starting. Okay, it's okay, but I can see your uh, slide. Okay, okay, yeah. well, I'm yeah, sorry for the technical, for, sorry for the technical hiccup. And of course, first I would like to start by um, expressing my gratitude for the invitation to the organizers um, um, to this wonderful um, webinar. And um, well, I will be um, talking about Hungary because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a native Hungarian. And uh, I think it's very interesting how this will add kind of a, a pinch of um, kind of a decolonial twist uh, to the things how, how now Hungary as a Central European country will be portrayed as the exotic or as the other in this presentation. So, um, 
So in this short presentation, I would like to give you a little bit of insight into the traditional female roles in Hungarian traditional uh, society. And, um, and well, naturally, um, uh, today, today females, um, um, females can do um, a, a lot more regarding professions. And, uh, and of course, males are also can do um, a lot more regarding household chores, but we will kind of, um, because things have changed significantly since or over the past 60 years, but we will look at, uh, kind of look into the past, how things were. And I think it might be interesting to look into the strategies, um, what uh, women could do in a traditional, in a patriarchal, in a male dominated society. So what I would like to do today is kind of look into um, and, and recognizing the agency of women in um, among patriarchal circumstances specifically. I don't know if you can see um, the slides because I jumped to my next slide, which is showing Hungary and, uh, and uh, you know, no, the way- you can't see your next slide. Um, you can't see, okay. No, you have to click, I think, on the- Um, Maybe now. Would you email me? Then I can just handle your slide if it's okay. Yes, yes, that would be wonderful. Yeah, if you can email it to me. I will email it to you very quickly. Are you emailing me in my personal email or? Yes, I can do okay. that. And did you send me? Yes, um, just a second. Um. Till the setup is complete, I would once again like to thank everybody who took time out to join us in this webinar, in this symposium. The speakers are, the diversity of the speakers and the range is wonderful to hear. For those who have missed it, can always catch up on it and catch up on the diversity later throughout the day. It will be available in IGNC YouTube channel and also on our other social platforms. Thank you so much. All our wonderful speakers who have joined, who have taken time out and have been part of our celebration of International Women's Day. We would take a few seconds more before we go on to Dr. Kinga's lecture. Please have patience since we are all working from remote locations. It is really difficult to coordinate. And these glitches as the last two years have taught us is hardly anything. The pandemic trauma that we have dealt with is, has made us all very patient. Thank you so much. I'm very sorry for this technical um, hiccup. <laughs> um, I so to say, I received it just. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so while you are starting um, um, my slides, um, can I just? Um, yeah. Wonderful. So the location will be Hungary. And um, in, in the first slide, I'm just showing you, 
you know, kind of just taking you to Hungary and uh, showing you where Hungary is. And um, really, as I said in my introductory words, um, the reasons uh, for and the, the choice behind my title, introducing traditional female roles in Hungarian um, um, traditional society is to really recognizing um, this agency of women in patriarchal circumstances. Now, um, um, there are a, a few particular um, roles that we could look at. Um, one would be really looking at the role of the maids um, traditionally. Yes, thank you very much. Wonderful. And we can go on. Yes, we can go on. Yes, very good. So, so yes, so you see Hungary in the center of Europe here. Um, and um, let's go on to the third slide, please, where you see some images. Um, one is a maid there, which would be one of the traditional roles. Uh, but I didn't want to talk about this because of the very hegemonic relationship between the master and uh, because of their very defenseless and vulnerable ways. And of course, they were often sexually exploited. So that's not a very nice way of uh, showing as empowerment for women. Another image there showing the Lamenters, which is more of a folkloric female genre, but, uh, but it was usually performed by female members of the deceased. Um, and the third um, image I'm showing there is a wise woman or a healer, but I didn't choose this profession or this traditional role for women because it wasn't um, it wasn't really just a, a, a women only profession it was more um, either man or woman so I decided to for today's um, talk to talk about the midwives actually and the, the role of the traditional midwives in traditional Hungarian society so we can go on to the next slide please and here you see um, that um, throughout history, uh, of course, there have been in every uh, there have been women in every community from whom other women have received support in women's affairs. So I know that this is a very universal topic, talking about traditional um, uh, midwives, um, and uh, this was generally the female roles or female problems. Um, uh, not turning, that we are not turning enough research um, on this uh, field. Um, unfortunately, of course, this has changed recently, but uh, there is still not enough research done on these female professions, female roles from a feministic, uh, feminist folkloristic point of view. And of course, we know uh, that uh, these um, oral or folkloric forms were differently linked to men and they were differently linked to women. Uh, however, we don't know much or, or, or enough about how these normative roles were um, and legal habits or through the legal habits they were, um, um, they were used or, or they were um, implicated. There, there are actually some very favored topics of female or femininity in, in folklore, uh, such as focusing on motherhood or focusing on, on witchcraft and witches. And these are very much researched, researched, but there are less, I mean, there are topics that uh, are um, unfortunately under-researched. And of course, um, we have to contemplate on um, really the reasons behind it, whether it's being the lack of archival sources. Um, and, and of course, there is the question, how are we addressing these silence, so-called silences, or, um, or um, in, in the archives, actually. So we can go on to the next slide. And uh, concerning uh, midwifery, there are actually uh, two um, sources I would like to bring up, or two sources, possible uh, sources. Uh, one would be the midwife's diary. And I'm just bringing you one example here, which is uh, uh, from a midwife. Uh, 
um, and uh, she was uh, using this diary from 42 to 54 and documenting 131 births. So just imagining how much information we could get from looking through all those midwife uh, diaries. And another one is actually a documentary film, which is um, um, documenting traditional minority um, Hungarian midwives from Transylvania, uh, but it's from 1997. So unfortunately, those traditional uh, midwives are um, uh, dying out uh, because uh, uh, this tradition is dying out. So maybe there won't be um, a further possibility to do oral history with them. So we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, and, and here are just a little bit, um, just images from, uh, this image is from midwife um, um, students and just uh, a little bit of uh, that the, the Hungarian word baba comes from um, uh, Slavic roots, it has Slavic roots, and it comes from uh, the meaning old women, uh, but it also means witch. So I think it's very, very interesting. And of course, uh, it's also important to point out that the training for the midwives actually began as, as long as the 1760s. So it has quite a long history. Uh, we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, and here I give you um, 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 an illustration. The, the top image is an illustration from a book for the midwives, which was published in 1817. And it's showing the difficult birth. So it's giving us examples for difficult birth. And then the next one below there is an image of a midwife certificate from 1884. But um, I need to say that midwives were always categorized into three categories. And uh, there was uh, the first category was the so-called peasant midwives who had no certificate. And they only, um, so, so they acquired their knowledge through the tradition of experience. And maybe they studied under the hands of a midwife and then become a midwife, but they had no official training at all whatsoever. And then there was the so-called, the, the next category was the tag or tagged midwives, which means that they only attended to a four to six week course in a hospital. And then there was the so-called learned midwives who completed uh, proper training um, in uh, midwifery institutes. So we can go on to the next uh, slide. And, uh, and of course, we don't have images from the midwives, um, you know, showing you the midwives in actual uh, action, so to say. But, but you, you, we have images showing them how they are taking the baby to the um, christening or to the baptism of the baby. Um, so why the why is the situation of midwives in traditional society important and interesting and why I'm talking about them today? Well, first, because it gave them being a midwife meant independence. Um, it meant financial stability. So this was, uh, they, could, they could exist irrespective of, of, of a male family member, of a husband or a father. Um, this also meant an esteemed uh, position uh, in the society and it gave them a special status in the local community. And of course, this was the very first jobs for females since the 18th century that they could actually take up. And we can also see midwives as the strengtheners of inter-ethnic or inter-religious ties. Why is that? Because they had entrance into each and every household in the local village, in the local community. So they actually strengthened those inter-ethnic or inter-religious ties uh, in the local communication. We can go on to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, so here I'm, I'm just giving a list of what kind of responsibilities did the midwives have, uh, but we can just kind of 
just uh, scan through this um, and run through this list. So, of course, they prepared for the childbirth, but they actually made the bed. They prepared the place for the childbirth. The, they cleaned the necessary tools and objects which they carried with them. Um, and they washed the baby. Uh, they went to take care of the mother and the newborn every day after the baby was born for usually a week. And then the midwife was actually taking the baby to the baptism. Um, uh, according to Christian traditions, this is the first ritual and this should be done in the, uh, this was done in uh, uh, a week from uh, the baby was born. And of course, they received a sum of money for their services, well, sometimes crops or food. The next slide we can go on. Thank you. Um, what is very interesting is that the midwives had several traditional spiritual role. Um, and they were, as I mentioned, and you see on the image, they were part of the christening of the baby, because of course, the mother was not yet present. So it, it's usually the the, the midwife and the godmother who is taking the baby for a christening. Most importantly, they also could perform something which is called an emergency baptism, uh, which means that uh, the mother was, um, the, the baby was, when in case the baby was in danger or it was uh, prematurely born, very low in weight, when they thought that they, the baby wouldn't live uh, a week or so. So the the midwife could perform this. And um, um, and of course, during childbirth, there were many, many sacred uh, things happening, like uh, they, they lit the sacred candle, there was a white tablecloth on the table, the mother uh, was um, encouraged to pray as long as she could during uh, childbirth. Uh, we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, and then uh, the midwife, while having these um, spiritual roles, she also had uh, a role in making certain magical actions happening um, um, to have the childbirth. Very interestingly, uh, there was they, they had to take care that they ensure that the evil do not become aware of that the women is in labor. So what they did is they made sure that all the doors and all the windows were carefully closed or or it everything was locked on the house. They even uh, forbid the women from shouting or wailing during childbirth in order not to attract the evil. It was uh, and then then also um, it was uh, encouraged that that the the husband's boots were pulled on the mother's leg, leg while uh, in labor, or uh, a piece of the husband's clothing were placed in the maternity bed. And uh, this was um, the reason for that was to deceive the harmful, harmful powers. And then they also put garlic, incense, prayer book um, in the maternity bed. Um, and very interestingly, they stick a knife or a fork into the ground under the bed also to to uh, deceive the harm, harmful powers. And then of course, sprinkling holy water, putting a rosary around the neck and so on were um, uh, important practices. Yes, we can go on. So we see that the, 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 um, the midwives have this mediator role between the other world um, and our world. And of course they had other important roles um, such as, and I'm translating here, uh, the Hungarian angel making, which was the folk expression for abortion, for um, um, because they made angels. I think it's understandable. And, um, and, and an even more important job of the midwives was that they could decide upon the fate of disabled or premature babies. And it was actually their job um, to, well, to end the life of those babies as well. And we can go on to the next uh, slide. Yes. Um, and, uh, well, of course, uh, this was happening uh, before the 1950s. And then with the 1950s, many changes occur. And, of course, um, um, with birth, um, 
um, they they kind of take uh, with hospitalization, they break away from the usual home environment and move um, uh, the the birthing mother to the so-called unknown place for women to the hospitals. And of course, this led to the termination of many, many ritualistic elements. And of course, um, another important, very important aspect is that hospitalization leads to a total man control in childbirth. Even though I'm, I'm showing you um, uh, an image with uh, with females, but but with women, but but uh, you know, I mean the doctors here. So um, in the most important turn in women's life, basically men have taken power over the bo women's body and the women's soul, and um, and of course, um, home childbirth could not be practiced once the hospital the hospitals were open so only since the 2000s after a series of legal battles which i cannot don't and don't have time to to go into it was allowed for women to choose home birth instead of giving birth in hospitals once again and let us go to our final slide please thank you so uh, most importantly, um, childbirth is an area that has been a source of women's knowledge and experience for millennia. And it was an almost exclusive area of female solidarity, uh, which is now exclusively under male dominance, under the aegis of hospitalization and progress. And of course, with the growing authority of male gynecologists, the knowledge of female anat anatomy and reproductive functions becomes a monopoly of men. Um, however, I did not want to end on this um, um, the sorrowful note. So, of course, um, um, there is some hope and, um, um, and uh, women are um, discovering um, doulas and there is a growing importance for what we call the birth doulas um, and um, and um, that might uh, bring uh, something back from um, the previously experienced um, tradition of women um, helping um, um, other women. So thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the technical problems once again. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinga, for presenting such a nice presentation on the uh, midwives uh, in Hungarian folk uh, culture. And uh, also with that, um, I just want to reflect on that uh, on the women's role in Hungarian dance. So how um, externally we feel that women are just uh, dancing and, uh, but actually when you are actually doing it, then they're actually supporting the men uh, while they, uh, while the women uh, carry the, uh, her partner's weight and dance the Hungarian folk dance. So basically how women are supporting and holding them and while the men performs their solo part. So that just brings me um, that thought about this uh, Hungarian folk dance. And also apart from that, uh, 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 we can also think uh, in India, also we have this tradition of Daima and uh, that's what I just felt it's so similar. And now I would like to ask if anybody got any question, please kindly type. Anyone got any question?
Okay, so uh, there is no question. So we move on uh, to our next speaker. Dr. Uttara Arsha Kurlawala ji. Uh, she's an adjunct professor, Barnard College and Columbia University. She's also a co curator of a dance festival. Uttara Asha Kurlawala is interested in bridges between theory and practice and on recirculations of movement through time and cultures. Her writings about the qualities of Indianness in dance have served as criteria at the international performance level. Practically, her advocation for culture-specific criteria by which to evaluate Asian classical forms in the high school level has informed current IB standards. She has advocated for development opportunities for artists and for performance opportunities for cross-cultural and interdisciplinary performers. Kurlawala was awarded the Sangeet Natak Academy Purashkar Award, India's highest award in the performing arts. It was the first time an American has received this award. Today, she'll be speaking on diversity and equality in teaching Indian dance history. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Arupa Lahiri, for organizing this IDMCA seminar in Baroda and for inviting me to participate in International Women's Day. So I feel like I really have something to do. Um, thank you, Sri Radha Paul, for moderating and all of you who helped to make this possible. And fellow panelists, I am very excited and honored to share the screen with you. So today I'm sharing my adventures in understanding equality and inclusivity through the eyes of women and men. The women, <clears throat> though I teach in a women's college, which is Barnett College, which is within the University of Columbia uh, system, uh, we do allow men into the classes and their, their presence contributes to what I consider diversity in the classes. So um, when I'm teaching, I experience the other sitting right opposite me, right next to me. I have students from all over the globe, from North America, from South America, from India, Pakistan, China, um, Africa, uh, West India. I have students who are taking the course because they love dance, and but who know very little about Indian dance. I have other students who know a lot about India, but not about dance. I have sporting involved students who heard that we analyze movement in the class and play, pay close attention to the body. So they show up and they create diversity in discussions. So when I first taught Western dance history, American dance history, I had students who questioned my right to teach the course. Then I taught world dance history and intercultural dance history. And always it was exciting and I was kept on my toes because there would be somebody in the class who was from a part of the world <clears throat> which I had not put in the syllabus. So there would be this disgruntled feeling of why is this form of dance not being acknowledged? Now I teach an Indian dance history course which I created and it's much easier, but it's still amazing to me how much is involved in dance and in uh, the way that it communicates and what's involved with it. So many different possibilities that come in with it. So some say that dance history is doomed because it attempts to recapture the impossible, which is to say movement, and movement is already over by the time we have noticed it. But much of what is being discussed now in my courses would not have been possible before YouTube and digital video processes. So we have that help and we can go back and recapture and rediscuss. <clears throat> However, my students and I are really very aware 
that what remains as pixels of colored light in our screens is mediated by the camera, by the eye of the person holding the camera, and by us, by our social values and the time and place that we are looking at it from. How do we look then beyond this rectangular frame? And that is what I really encourage my students to ask and to know, because this is one thing I've learned from them is that the, uh, that the questions are sometimes more important than the answers. So I had a different group of students again when I taught at the Alvin Ailey School of Professional Dance. <clears throat> Here the students were extremely committed and they had a personal stake in understanding how dance history is made. They wanted to know who gets to be written about. What is the process by which that comes about? Who remains in the waiting room of dance history and for how long? Who is left out? Why? What in dance history is important to me today? Why is it that a dance history project becomes a personal quest for wholeness? That last question is my question. And this question is important to me because again and again at the end of the course, I ask that question. At the end of the course, each participant is invited to share a 10 minute topic related to the coursework, but not necessarily covered in the course. So what I end up hearing is stories of having to do with identity, having to do with relationships removed from Indian dance, but connected to it. For example, I had a West Indian student whose great grandfather had been Indian and who studied Chutney math core dance, which is what they do in Trinidad. And she had been very upset at not being called Indian. So she had taken this course to find out what that meant and shared at the end of the course, a beautiful poetic presentation on Chutney math core and her relationship to it. So this is just one example of the kind of variety of situations that work into dance history. Um, and you would never know uh, that dance history can be so diverse. Um, I try to give the students a structure uh, of topics and issues from post-colonial to colonial pasts. <clears throat> I invite them to dance with stones. I invite them to dance with the sculptors of the stones and the patrons of the sculptors. I invite them to read texts and between the lines of the texts to learn about the history and the agendas and the effects of those texts. I am really going to pay attention now whenever I see that there is an interpolation. It could have been a woman. That's very interesting that I learned today. We have to know who made the records that exist today. Why were they made? Why are they accessible to us now? What are the politics that drive publications? Then there are what I call the her stories, the stories of individual performers who don't have a place in history. They don't have a, a, a belong in a pigeonhole that we can find comfortably to fit them into. Um, we have stories of, for example, Madame Manaka, who goes off to Germany and performs there, and um, who comes back and starts a Kathak school, but we cannot find much that's left of her work to see that would turn us on. So each question leads to one more question. We ask, who owns the dance? For example, if we talked about Ala Repu, this was a big issue. Who owns the copyright issues? Who owns the right to own the stance and to teach it and to pass it and to share it? What kind of choreography can we inherit that survives beyond its chain of performers? What part of it do we inherit? Or do we inherit it at all? How do we interpret the leftovers of bygone dances? We see uh, films of dancers way past their prime performing items that they were famous for. And suddenly we're not so turned on, we're not so excited about this dancer as we were when we read about them. How do you interpret that? 
Might we be reading what's in our own heads and in our imaginations? Whose reality are we looking at when we look at dance history? From dance history, I learned that the movements that I invented, or at least I thought that I had invented based on my own kinesthetic explorations, were actually in somebody else's repertory a long time ago. So dance is about much more than ways of living and being in the body. To me, dance is a combination of consciousness, awareness, and matter, whatever that may be. Dance history has become much more subtle in its investigations now. But can historiographic me uh, methods really unpack ways of being? Is choreography a graphing of patterns in space as early European dance masters would have it? Is choreography the original expression of genius, which is what Martha Graham would like us to believe, or Picasso? Um, is talent inborn? Do you just have to be born with it to be great? Do we think that talent can be acquired by, say, if I danced for many lives, would I be reborn with great talent? Or is performance a collective process greater than the sum of its parts? Or is performance the sum? I like to ask my students questions because I know that I can never fully answer or look at what we're looking at. And to do this, I will share um, an incident that made me arrive at my method of teaching. And it's what I call the coffee story. Yes, coffee story. So I'm at the uh, cafeteria at Barnard College buying a cup of coffee and I choose the almond flavored coffee. And when I get up to the, um, the register to pay for it, the lady of the register asks me, well, what coffee did you get? What's in your cup? So I say, oh, the better coffee, meaning the more expensive one. But immediately I'm corrected. The person behind me says, no, you really mean the more expensive one, don't you? Not the better coffee. It's not better because it's more expensive. And of course, this is a student at Barnard and her response instant really made me think about who I'm teaching, what is diversity? What is equality when you're talking about coffee? What is not part of equality and diversity. It's sort of like dance history. Everything is a part of it. What gives depth to meaning and to form and to its history? Is it our need for an authentic, indescribable experience that drives us to find it in dance? Dance history interconnects with all that we have been and all that we actually still are. But how do we mind that? If all of histories are individual, then what is it that we have in common that dance can express and that it can speak to an audience of diverse individuals? What is the mystery of reception? How does meaning travel from body to body to body? Dance history is full of interrogation marks with spaces between them that we try to fill up in the excitement of solving puzzles while enjoying our own capacities to think physicality and to understand physicality. And that's where I end and I thank you for sharing my process with me and welcome your questions and responses. Thank you so much for sharing uh, uh, this lecture and also your experience around your coffee story. It was really interesting. And uh, it is indeed important to address the diversity and inclusivity in the Indian dance pedagogy. And thank you so much for throwing light on that. Any questions? Uh, anybody got any questions?
Okay, probably um, uh, there is no question. So, ma'am, thank you so much. Now we'll move on with our next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Dr. Ann R. David. She uh, did her PhD and MA and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and Fellowship of the Higher Education Academy. Ann R. David is Professor of Dance and Cultural Engagement at the University of Roehampton, London. She specializes in dance anthropology and South Asian classical and popular dance. Her dance training includes ballet, contemporary folk dance, as well as Bharatanatyam and Kath. Anne's research work has focused on dance and ritual practices in UK, Indian communities, investigating issues of migration, identity, and embodiment, and the gestural, narrative, and ritual practices of Bharatanatyam. She has published widely on this work, as well as on dance in Bollywood and on the ritual dances of Tibetan Buddhism, and has just completed a monograph of Indian dancer Ram Gopal published by Bloomsbury. Anne is passionate about the need for the arts and dance in education, working closely with policymakers in the arts and is on board <laughs> of several arts organizations. She has given public talks at the v &A and the British Library, British Museum and National Poetry Gallery and been involved in post show discussion at Asia House, Nehru Center, Sadler's Well, South Bank and Bhavan and has appeared on BBC and TV on several occasions and is on the editorial board of a variety of academic journals. Today, she'll be sharing uh, her, she'll be talking on arts inclusivity, health, bodies, and well-being at the center, not periphery. And over to you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Sri Radha, for that uh, very nice introduction. And thank you to all those who've organized this event. It's um, a great privilege to be sharing this and being on the webinar with some other wonderful women. And I'm very delighted to follow uh, behind my dear friend Uttara uh, with her wonderful presentation just before me. In a, <clears throat> a minute or two, I'm going to share my screen, but I wanted to just say, first of all, that I'm not um, deliberately actually not going to talk specifically about women nor about the binary between men and women. Um, but I want to think more holistically about inclusivity and equality um, for, for, for all of us. And of course, women play um, a very important and significant part in the stories that I'm going to, to relate, as you'll see. And um, we, have, uh, as women, have to um, assert our influence and power in this area, without, again, without doubt. So let me, without further ado, just share my screen. Okay. So a new definition of health as a condition of well-being, free of disease or infirmity, and a basic and universal human right was argued by Rodolfo Saracci to the World Health Organization. Considering this, how might dance and the arts in general provide a tool for the health and well being of society, ensuring people have access to such basic human rights? This talk will consider some of the current, some current examples of how the arts can be used as, as mediums of uplift, inclusivity, and equality, and the role women play in this significant area. using two screens, so give me a second. I'm starting first with the inclusive amateur dance theatre company, Amiki, who are based in West London, UK. Amiki Dance Theatre is a large group of 30 to 40 members, which integrates performers with physical dis disabilities, learning difficulties, sensory impairments, and those who are able-bodied. <clears throat> it was founded in 1980 by Wolfgang Stanger, who brings his German expressionist dance roots to full length works that are produced and toured biannually. In today's climate where the term disability is deeply contested and often laden with social and political meanings of negativity and tragedy, how does Amiki, now in its 
in its existence for over 40 years, survive and thrive. I look at Stanger's vision, his female dance mentor, as I said, the women are always here, his teaching techniques and at the impact that Amiki has on both its participants and audiences. And I'm going to just take a look at their work that strives to ensure that disability and inclusiveness is at the heart of evolving dance, arts policy and practice and their commitment to having all types of bodies at the center rather than on the margins. And what's on the screen is a quote from a dance critic, Luke Jennings, who wrote, where others saw limitation, Stanger saw potential. Where others saw a medical condition, Stanger saw the possibility of a new form of expression. He believed that the key to performance was honesty, the presentation of the authentic self, end of quote. So in their productions, physical and mental impairments are not only acknowledged, but placed center stage with no comprom compromise. You leave the theater with tears in your eyes, but with a spring of joy in your step. So I'm just going to come on to that in a minute. Um, it's Wednesday evening, a large dance studio at the top of a theatre building. Slowly the group gathers, each member as they arrive being greeted warmly by all those present. Chatting, laughing, changing into soft shoes, carers attending to those who need it. We gather in a circle holding hands. Two members are in wheelchairs. To a loud vocal whoosh, everybody raises their arms together in the air and brings them down bending their bodies simultaneously. This is repeated two or three times. Rosie, who has Down syndrome, then goes to each member stating their name and making the signed initial for their name as they join her. A for Angie, M for Mike, S for Stephen, etc. These are great warm up and introductory practices. Over the two hour class, each participant will demonstrate movement sequences in pairs or small groups. Give me a second. <clears throat> and will initiate action and be applauded after such presentations. Encouragement and support is generously given, but there is never sentimentality. One exercise using a magic, ordinary pen thrown on the floor that twists around and then points to the next leader, asks the participant to show a short movement sequence. Later, they draw these expressions on paper with felt-tip pens and choreograph them for a group. No one is excluded, even if behavior is challenging. Gentleness, encouragement, non-compromise, and a deep sense of non-difference is at the heart of all that is practiced. Rosie works with Bill, who is wheelchair bound and can only speak through an electronic board. They dance a duet together, showing the energy that runs between each other's hands when they are close, but not touching. Here's a short and beautiful clip of their dance. Watch Bill's smiles as he joins her, and I hope this will play all right. It's often a bit difficult on Zoom. So Bill was the group member selected in their performance piece Tightrope in 2010 to fly above the stage on a wire, a, de a decision deliberately made to allow Bill to be free of his wheelchair bound existence. Um, I'm not sure how much you can see this slide with the, I'll just move away. Um, a spotlight opens on Bill Robbins, principal performer in his wheelchair. I'll leave you to read the rest, but the, this, this piece is based on a poem that he wrote that's on the screen there. The dancing that I both participate in and watch is confirmative, totally inclusive, 
and looks directly to each human being's potential. Language, touch, music, rhythm are used with care and intention. In these ways, each member of the group is allowed to develop their own creativity uh, in their own ways of expression. Just a few more pictures of the practice area. Stanger's inspiration came directly from his teacher, the visionary Hilda Holger, who as early as the 1960s was working not only with her own Down syndrome son and teaching him to dance, but choreographing a piece at Sadler's Wells London for young adults with learning disabilities. Interestingly, Holger had fled Nazi Germany to live in Mumbai as World War II broke out, establishing a studio of modern dance there and working with Indian dancers Ram Gopal and Uday Shankar. After 10 years there, she then moved to London where she remained uh, for the rest of her, working for the rest of her life. And there's some pictures on the beach in Mumbai. Um, Stanger created in 1996, a dance tr tribute to her in which the dramas of her life, her journey from Germany to India and beyond, was shown with piercing directness and huge sympathy by Stanger and his artists. Stanger also continues to work extensively in Sri Lanka with refugees and in the re rehabilitation centers for the ex-terrorists, the Tamil Tigers, and has created an inclusive dance theater, the Butterfly Theater Company, which integrates Sri Lanka's communities of Sinhalese, Tamil, Muslim, and Burger. Um, Tamil, Muslim, and Sinhalese refugees from the East Coast share the stage with disabled soldiers, youngsters born with Down syndrome, and those with autism, or hearing or sight impairment. And productions are presented in four languages, including sign language. So what we see in these examples is the practice of cultural democracy in action. Members of Amiki are co-creators, collaborators in all that takes place. They are colleagues, not healthcare clients, immersed and integrated into the workshops, the creation of choreographic materials, rehearsal, and performances of the groups. It's a two-way relationship where power and responsibilities are shared. Rosie, mentioned above, is now co-leader of a younger group of practitioners between 11 and 25 with disabilities called Young Amiki, set up five years ago with some local funding. She has traveled with the second co-leader to Lithuania to teach performance companies there techniques of integration based on her experience with arts and performance work. So looking more to the more general scene, the Arts Council has in, in the UK has supported a programme of cultural democ democracy in the arts for some time, time, setting out in their 2018 booklet the following statements, which I've got on the slide. Um, the programme is proving that engaging communities, participants and audiences in decision making processes is enabling deeper participation with arts and culture particularly in places with traditionally low levels of cultural engagement. The process of being involved in commissioning is enabling individuals to feel a sense of ownership over the arts and cultural provision in their local area. And they also say it's called cultural democracy because it's about the inclusion of everyone. It's about fundamentally shifting the way we talk, think about and value culture. So that's the end of that quote. So I think we need to acknowledge, however, that sharing democratic ownership can be difficult. Outcomes are not necessarily predictable. There may be concerns about artistic integrity and those of us used to working with elite and trained performance artists may not find it easy to accommodate different bodies, different capabilities, etc. It may feel counterintuitive to be inclusive by those set, used to setting the agenda and leading with artistic control. Dance writer and critic Clement Crisp, um, who sadly has just passed away, known for his exacting, precise reviews of traditional ballet performances, said when he visited Amiki, uh, and I quote him, I recall a version of Giselle, that sacred test, text for great ballet companies, which Stanger produced and directed, and which tore at the heart far more and far more touchingly so than the dutiful exercise in romanticism that it can seem when offered by ballet troops." End of quote. So there were five key areas of value um, 
identified by the Arts Council, which were, well, I'll just read them out, they're on the screen, I'll try and move this again away. Leader as facilitator, which does away with a kind of top-down approach. Agency and permission that are, allows um, freedom to be given to all involved. Valuing of everyone or equality of expertise, and that might bring different skills to the table. For example, um, one charity that we, I'm working with at the moment, Arts and Homelessness International, remark how resilient, empathetic, entrepreneurial, and communicative their clients are. Um, and the fourth point here, active participation, that's rather than just spectatorship, just watching, and then valuing the process and the product equally so that the focus is not just on the finished product. Now, there are many, many examples here in the UK, elsewhere in the world, certainly in India, of new creative projects that support this contemporary thinking on cultural democracy. I give one other example here. Slung Low is an award-winning theatre company in the north of the UK, which started in 2000 and is, is known for its community performances. It became a beacon of light during the lockdowns in the pandemic. It created a food bank, giving free food to those in need and delivering parcels to those who were unable to get out, parcels of food. It started a cultural community college where sessions ranging from stargazing to cooking, singing, carpentry, and many other subjects are offered to all those wishing to partake freely. People can decide to pay if they can. The content of these sessions is driven by the users and the policy, again, at the heart of it is access to culture for all. And there are many, many more examples of cultural institutions and groups enabling greater access for health and well-being in the community. And another final example, just to finish with, is I'm running a, a homelessness awareness week at our university in two weeks time, where we're offering the space to a young poet to be our poet in residence for the week. He's homeless and without work, but he writes the most powerful and heart-rending poetry about the stigmas of being homeless. And with that, he'll engage with our students and staff. So I think it behoves us all as women in positions of influence to open our institutions, to open our classes, our work, to give greater access to all, especially for those who find themselves in positions where participation may be difficult. Then maybe we can allow dance and the arts in general to provide the tools for health and well-being of society and ensure people have access to such basic human rights through the medium of culture. And I've just, I'm finishing there, but I just realized I didn't move on to the final slide. I can just get to it, um, which is on slung, slung Low, but I won't show the film clip there, but just to say that's the company I was talking about and it can be found online. So thank you very much, all of you, for your attention. I'll come out of sharing now. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, for sharing uh, this uh, lecture. And uh, this year's theme is uh, Break the Bias. And uh, your lecture actually resonates and your research re resonates with this year's theme. Thank you for uh, putting this up. And, uh, and it's indeed important. Uh, it is the need of the hour to think about health body shaming, mental well-being, and inclusivity in our community. Thank you so much. Anybody got any questions? Please um, feel free to type, or else we'll move on to our next speaker. Okay, I think uh, we will move on to our final speaker and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Our final speaker of today's event is Professor Dr. Neeti Desai Chopra. She is the Dean in the Faculty of Journalism and Communication at the MSU University, Baroda. She has an experience of more than 30 years and a fellow at NAFIC, Netherlands, and fellow of the Salzburg 
Global of Experience and Seminar, Austria. Her major research work is on water and sanitation management and portrayal of women in OTT platforms. Today, she'll be speaking on women at the center of societal flux insights from concurrent media research projects. Hello, uh, my warmest greetings to everyone. And it has been indeed a pleasure to listen to all my co-panelists. Um, I'm glad to have been given this opportunity uh, to share some of my insights from the work that I've been doing in the past few years. Um, I happen to uh, develop an interest in communication research uh, through actually my initial work in the visual uh, media. So after my uh, post-graduation uh, studies, uh, I actually worked for many years in DECU, which is called the Development and Educational Communication Unit of the Indian Space Research Organization based in Ahmedabad. And then subsequently, I was working in, uh, uh, in, the, in the UGC's Educational Media Research Centers. And uh, that's where I actually started cultivating an interest in the communication research component uh, of content that is generated um, you know, for mass media communication. So um, uh, in my early research experience, I not only was working on scripts and doing production design, but I also was observing all the time uh, you know, uh, the gender slants um, as they were, whether equal, inclusive, or, um, uh, or uh, remedial. Uh, so from there, I uh, later had to give up uh, actually my hands-on work and went on to uh, become an academician. And uh, that's where the mentoring with uh, for uh, and with students uh, started. And interestingly, our students uh, took up uh, many interesting topics. And I would say it was a very wide and interesting continuum of uh, uh, you know studies taken up either uh, from uh, folk theater or uh, you know folklore's or contemporary theater to, uh, ma uh, to the mass, uh, the social uh, media, as well as, uh, you know, the newer trends and um, a phenomena of augmented advertising. So um, my own work actually uh, centered around many interesting things and I affiliated closely uh, with the Women's Studies Research Center of our university. And um, just to mention an interesting study uh, I had, because I, I heard um, you know, about uh, disability, I thought I may mention that um, uh, in WSRC at one point, we did a study on issues of uh, self-esteem and, um, and self-image of visually challenged women. And it turned out to be a very insightful experience. And I developed a great empathy and an interest in being able to work uh, much more with uh, women with uh, uh, you know, challenges. And it always ended up uh, with me feeling uh, that uh, they, are more, they are stronger and more resilient uh, than us. And um, that uh, no amount of work that one would do with them would be enough. My second uh, major, uh, there have been many projects, but I'm just mentioning the two, uh, the other one being uh, water and media, uh, which was taken up uh, through the government of Gujarat uh, agency uh, called Water and Sanitation Management Organization. And during uh, this study was a three prong approach. And uh, in that um, uh, we met uh, with uh, media people who were covering uh, water issues we met with the sarpanch or the heads of the villages in which the project was ongoing. And we did a content analysis of the coverage of media stories pertaining to water. So it was very interesting and the findings um, uh, were always um, uh, reflecting uh, that, um, uh, you, you know, the women, uh, even though if the serpent had been a male, but if there had been a woman serpent in a particular village or community, then the effect of that particular, uh, you know, implementation of the project had been uh, much more um, uh, effective. 
And uh, then uh, secondly, um, we also found uh, that uh, wherever uh, and whenever there were the women's self-help groups, as we call them, SHGs, um, uh, the sustained, uh, uh, you know, impact of the implementation of uh, particular initiatives, uh, namely like uh, the tap uh, being installed in each and every village uh, of the of the each each and every home of the village. Uh, how well it was um, received, how well the financial planning and the cooperation was received. Everything was much better done or implemented when there were women at the helm of affairs. So having given this little background, I will spend a little more time uh, telling you about uh, my concurrent research, uh, which is on um, you know, the OTT platforms. So as you all know, uh, the OTT platforms have become, um, you know, uh, have, have kind of permeated into our lives uh, for entertainment, for education, for information. And um, uh, the pandemic actually brought about this shift in a major way because we were uh, mostly homebound and OTT platforms became a very convenient way of uh, engaging uh, with, with content. So um, uh, to tell you about this, uh, this project of ours is uh, being done jointly with uh, the Department of Human Development and Family Studies in the Family and Community Sciences in the Faculty of Family, Family and Community Sciences and our Faculty of Journalism and Communication. Uh, once again, it is a three-pronged approach, and um, the, the first uh, objective being to understand uh, how the viewers are receiving the content. The second is to understand how uh, to get the insights from the, uh, from the protagonists themselves, the actors, the writers, the directors, um, uh, you know, the producers of this uh, content. And the third is content description of uh, of the of the series uh, which are being put out on the ott platform so in a way it's a case study of uh, oho i mean oho is an exclamation uh, in gujarati which which uh, which kind of expresses uh, uh, delight uh, where we say oho this is great uh, just as we say oh this is great in gujarati oho also expresses um, you know, delight and um, a, a, a sense of uh, enjoyment. Um, of course, it depends on the intonation and in the situation in which uh, it is used. So I will just quickly tell you about, um, uh, yes, um, we can stay with the first visual. I will just quickly tell you about um, uh, the storylines and how the shift in the portrayal of women has been happening. So the first uh, series that I have taken up, uh, that we, we are studying all the series, but the first one about which I want to tell you is called Tuition. Now, as you may know that, um, uh, you know, in our, in the Indian culture, along with regular studies, there is this concept of tuition. Uh, Sri Radha, can I have the picture, please? The next slide, yes. So here is, uh, it's written in Gujarati tuition. And um, so it's about um, a very innocent uh, teenage love. And it's about this girl who uh, walks into a class uh, filled with boys. So apparently she has missed the earlier uh, classes owing to some personal reason, the transfer of her father to a particular town. And so the, the tuition teacher actually encourages her to come into a class filled with boys. And, um, and that's where a very touching romance between one of the boys and her evolves. And, um, and then we are taken through this in 10 minute episodes uh, through how in the end, um, you know, uh, they are separated and, um, and, and the girl marries, but the boy doesn't. And um, he himself starts his own tuition classes in the end. And, his, and, the, and this young girl's daughter walks into his tuition class and the whole uh, narrative goes into a kind of a flashback. So the thread of inclusivity to uh, understand over here is the young girl's, uh, uh, you know, confidence uh, because the setting is a, a, a rural setting in India. 
uh, where it is not very easy for a young girl to walk into and do really well with her studies along with uh you know uh the rest of the class uh being only boys and uh, the narration and the production uh, treatment is handled in a very very delicate way then the next one uh is um, yes please uh, yeah so this is one of the shots of um, uh, of the boy uh, of the girl and all the boys in her class next please Yes. Then another uh, storyline is called Kadak Mitti. Again, a phrase in Gujarati, which is used for uh, for the tea, uh, which is uh, traditionally made uh, by mixing milk and um, water and adding the tea dust or the tea leaves to it, and Mitti because the sugar element is also added, and the tea is brought to a uh, brought to a boil till it becomes quite strong. now kadak mithi uh, suggests a relationship between a mother and daughter the daughter has moved to another city for work and the entire series all the episodes are about their interaction over the telephone so uh, in their conversations many many different layers of day to day life um uh, discrimination inclusivity everything is included in the script of the episodes and in their conversations and that is what makes this uh, series uh, a very unique one uh, next please yeah so here are shots of uh, both of them at uh, different locations and uh, the entire narrative is only in form of conversations between the mother and the daughter and uh, showing and suggesting the strong bond between women of different age groups even in the conversations that are followed we we get to hear of uh, them sharing notes about their neighbors about the communities in which they work and um, about their day to day uh, trials and tribulations so uh, yet another interesting series from the women's uh, portrayal perspective uh, yes next please shri radha yes uh now if uh, any of you are familiar with the city of ahmedabad uh, and uh, like anywhere else in the world uh, sometimes uh, a river front is developed uh, along the main river which is flowing through the city so in the city of ahmedabad there is the sabarmati river and on both sides there is a beautiful river front uh, which has developed now there is a uh, there are four episodes uh, called river front stories and one of it is called vat ratma meaning uh, uh something that has happened uh, at night like overnight now this is a very interesting story where this young woman is trying to do some work at a cafe on the river front and what happens over there is that uh, there is a, a while uh, there is a player uh, there is a couple uh, uh, a very ordinary um, uh, couple who are not well off and who make their living by just playing a string instrument along the river front so the music of it's uh, it's beautiful it's melodious but it bothers this girl a lot because she's not able to focus on her work and clearly she's shown into she's shown as having a lot of stress at that particular time so she goes up to this man and pulls the instrument from his hand and breaks it and then she just runs away um so there is a uh, there is an altercation uh, that follows and then uh, the this uh, this woman the protagonist she just goes and sits in one corner of the bridge and uh, she goes into a kind of catharsis i mean she just she's just blanked out and uh, she doesn't respond to the calls of her sister or, or to the calls of the cafe owner who says it's really late and you ought to get home and then in a moment of catharsis what happens is that that same person somehow he manages to get another instrument and the bow with which he is playing the strings and then uh, he actually just goes up to this girl and plays it for her and this time she finds it's really beautiful and cathartic and then she just breaks down into uh, a flood of tears 
And the really interesting thing about this episode is that we are not told as an audience, we are not told at all what the problems are that she's facing or whether it is a social situation or is it an economic crisis that she's facing. We do not get to know anything. It is left to our imagination, but it is very beautifully visually um, uh, crafted. And uh, very few uh, script lines are included in it. Uh, but uh, the narration is is just phenomenally beautiful. And any woman, just anybody watching this episode would connect with the agony that we experience, um, uh, agony that the young girl is shown to be experiencing. So that is, uh, that is the third episode that I wanted to talk about. Um, then next, please, Shirada. Okay, so here is, uh, here is the man who's playing the string instrument and another family who's actually delighting uh, in his performance. Uh, but obviously the protagonist of this particular episode was not able to understand, uh, you know, kind of take it, up, uh, you know, in the correct spirit uh, initially, but later on it actually helps her uh, catharsis. Yes, next please. So here is the cathartic moment. And you can see in the background, uh, uh, so in the foreground is this woman. And there you can see that uh, little string instrument is lighted up and uh, how she just goes through the catharsis with the playing of the instrument. So an irony, which is projected in a very visually interesting way. Yes, next please. Okay, now this is very interesting because it has the role of a very understa understanding uh, male members in the family. So uh, this is called this is 110, which is written in uh, in Gujarati. Uh, it is called Exodus in Gujarati, and um, it the this number is kind of a late motif. You know, it's kind of repeated at different places. So, for example, the weight of this man, he's an RJ in a, in a radio station and has his own dreams of marrying. But because of his overweight, he's not able to find a partner. Uh, but uh, later, uh, he does find uh, a girl and they get married and then they have a baby and the baby would wake up always at 110 in the middle of the night and how the relationship becomes strained between him and his wife between his wife and his mother because of the typical dynamics that play out when a, when a family goes into this kind of a typical uh, social mode. And uh, so it's very interesting here because actually the two male members are projected as more understanding. So he as an RJ is also projected as a very understanding and patient person. And his father also is very patient with the tantrums that his wife throws and um, how this, uh, how through a cathartic talk in the studio, which is hosted as a show, he's able to uh, kind of bring his mother and his wife together. So can we have the next visual, please? So here it is. He uses his intelligence and his creativity to help his wife and his mother resolve their problems with each other uh, through a conversation in the studio. So this is very interesting. It's a, it's a very unique and interesting format of the, of the program. And uh, many such other interesting episodes are there involving the same actors and the, and the same storyline. Uh, yes, next please. Yes, and then uh, yet another example that I would like to give uh, before I end is that of a series called Happily Never After. And in this too, it's about the lawyers, as you can see in the poster, they are also uh, formerly a couple now divorced. And so uh, they carry the baggage of their, of the experience of their own marriage to the counseling that they do or the cases that they fight for the younger couples. So both of them actually anchor. Incidentally, uh, this couple, the male ends up going to the uh, this advocate, and the female ends up going to the female advocate who was formerly his wife. 
And so they actually, instead of uh, first helping them to reconcile, uh, they actually just encourage that uh, they should uh, they should separate because uh, you know if if you're if you uh, I mean if they are uh, troubled in their marriage, then um, it's best that they uh, that they uh, separate and live their own lives. Uh, so this man who is shown in the background is actually the judge who pronounces, um, you know, um, uh, the final statement. And he actually is a counselor and um, he counsels the couples uh, very uh, fairly and patiently before he actually takes up the proceeds in the court. And uh, he actually helps them to, to reconcile, stating his own example um, of how lonely he has become after his wife has passed away. So, um, well, not being judgmental about the content, but uh, just as portrayals. Uh, next. Yes, so here he is. Uh, he calls them to, to their home and uh, offers them counseling on a, on a personal level. And there is his wife's picture in the background. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. All right. So uh, just just let's go back to the uh, to the previous one so that I can just give a little bit of a background to the other uh, stories which are there. So I have put up only these few images, but um, you know what I do want to share with everyone is that uh, having um, you know uh, observed the content on television and OTT platforms, uh, both regional and uh, national. I feel that there is a shift in the way the storylines are being handled. And um, I think that uh, women are uh, projected also in terms of their personalities, in terms of the careers that they are uh, shown to be having in the series, uh, and also in terms of their interpersonal dynamics, either within the family or in extended, uh, in their extended uh, fraternities, whether it is work or, uh, or other spheres. So this uh, shift is there and uh, we do not know what, where this influence is coming from, but I feel that it is quite heartening that now we are able to get uh, content in which the women are put, pro projected uh, a, with a certain kind of um, uh, uh, you know, uh, inclusivity and fair play. So uh, in conclusion, uh, what I would like to say is that, um, can we go to the next slide please? While the question remains whether it is difficult to determine who is contingent on whom, is the content uh, that is generated for the mass media consumption, whether it be on radio or television or OTT platforms or advertisements or print or any other, uh, who is contingent on whom? We are not able to decide that. Um, however, I feel that uh, the future seems a beat, though perhaps a little complex, because now the regulatory mechanisms are also coming into play. We have to deal with a lot of uh, freedom of expression, uh, vis a -vis the right to privacy, and many other such um, uh, you know, policies. And also the social political trends as they emerge vis a -vis, uh, uh, you know, a very... Um, uh, dynamic societal ambience. Uh, but um, I would like to end by saying that uh, women, however, will continue to inspire with their reserves of patience, creativity, resilience, and sense of fair play. And I'm sure that uh, stories will continue to be told and the threads of inclusivity, equality, and creativity will be tugged at in, um, in definitely more interesting ways uh, than ever before. So I'll end on that note and thank you so much. And I'm, I'm open to any questions or discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dr. Neeti Chopra ma'am uh, for sharing this um, uh, lecture with us. And uh, we could understand the dynamic uh, roles and the protection, how the women are projected in the media mm -hmm. industry. Thank you for reflecting on that. Uh, do we have any questions? I think now we will wrap up. So I would like to invite uh, our regional director, uh, Arupa Lahiri ma'am, please. Thank you so much for this opportunity. 
Thank you. Thank you, Shraddha. And thank you to each and every one of you, as I said, even in the beginning of the session, between Dr. Shweta and uh, Dr. Neeti Chopra, I think we have traversed a vast, vast timeline. Not to talk about space, because I think this entire curated list of speakers was what Dr. Joshi had been mentioned in his inaugural address, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. So we here were listening, understanding the various layers and nuances of what it is to be a woman, to become a woman. Starting from understanding the position of women in the early Vedic and early Puranic age to moving on to understanding a personal uh, understanding of the bureaucratic life. We moved on to discuss and understand the Ardhanarishwar concept, the vast range of exploration of Ardhanarishwara in the Indian iconography. Kinga Povidak's lecture on how a midwife was understood and accepted in the Hungarian folklore added dimensions to our understanding of women. We, had, we have got a very similar kind of uh, women in our society who are called the dais, who are also the midwives and how they are looked at. The very pertinent questions raised by Dr. Uttara uh, Asha Kullawala will continue to make us think the shared body subconscious who owns the dance are indeed some of the personal, very personal questions that will con continue to haunt me. Coming to Professor Ann David's lecture, it was wonderful. She went beyond, she took us, all of us beyond the binaries. She made us think about a concept of cultural democracy and also understand what are the key areas of value. Dr. Neeti Chopra's lecture was all about what it is, how a woman is portrayed in today's world. And yes, I, I think that was a very nice statement to understand that when it comes to implementation, women are still much better administrators, implementers. And then she moved on to talk about the OTT platforms, which are, of course, the rage of today's time. Thank you, all of you, all our speakers. May I request each one of you to switch on the video so that we can see all of you together. We can't be uh, physically present in the platform, but to see all of you together, to be together, I hope this lecture will soon be in the physical format. Thank you so much for being part of this celebration of International Women's Day, and I hope this trend will continue. Thank you, Shubhratri, good night. And once again, let me reiterate that these lectures will be available on our YouTube channel and social media platforms, and you can revisit them anytime that you want. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Mm-hmm.